Welcome to another edition of Hacking TV. This week, Steve goes on a road trip to Vegas. Is it a search mission to CES? Or a boondoggle to drink and play the slots? Or maybe just five days solid of standing in line and doing nothing else? You know, there were a lot of lines. It's probably a bit of both, but I saw some keynotes from our most important hackers in the TV world, and we'll talk about that. Like Comcast, YouTube, and Netflix. Indeed. Um, this is Hacking TV live version. Hey, I'm Steve Rosenbaum. And I'm Saul Hansel. Greetings, and everyone. So much for the uh, live feedback on Twitch TV, but... We are hacking as we speak, and there is a lot to talk about. So, first, the lust question. What did you see at CES that you want to own and play with? Well, before I say that, can you turn down the volume on your Twitch side? Yeah. And that way, or maybe shut off Twitch, I think. is what, I'm, I'm going to shut off Twitch on my side. And that way, this is the first live show, so we're allowed to make mistakes. And I just shut Twitch. I, I shut off the monitor so we can talk about CES. What do I want? Um, I want VR. I do. I want Oculus. I want VR video. This is the year it's going to happen. It was sexy. It was everywhere. I want me VR headgear and I want me, you know, VR uh, broadcast gear. And what shows entertainment news? What is going to do all of that elaborate production for you uh, that you're going to make it be more interesting than a Viewmaster? Um, I don't think shows are going to do it first. I think real people are going to do it first. Okay. And I was on a panel where we talked about, part of why we're doing the show live is because I was on a panel talking about live streaming and how important it is. And then I went, you know, got to eat my own dog food here. Got to gotta start to dip our toe in. Maybe, maybe we'll start getting comments. Maybe people will start talking to us. I mean, I don't even know if that'll work or not. Certainly not on this uh, podcast. But um, uh, I think, oh, I'll just give you one example. So I'm on my panel, and the panel ends, and we're going to Q&A with the audience. And there's a woman sitting in the front row, young woman, and she's holding two phones, uh, one in each hand. And she says, um, my viewers have a question. Okay. She's, she's on both periscope. One on, not one on each of the phone. Both of her viewers have a question. No, as it turns out, she's a big deal. Her name is XOXO Liza. Okay. And she has a huge following. And they were complaining, her viewers, because the way the stage was set up, uh, there was kind of a wall between the panel and the audience. And they didn't like what her viewers described as the Trump wall between us and them. Um, she's a bit, I, I didn't know who she was. I've since researched her. She's one of the early, early live streaming folks coming out of the Periscope Meer Meerkat world. And um, pretty big deal. I, you know, we have these two trends crashing into each other. Everybody can broadcast live, and yet we are moving to an on-demand world. I have been very skeptical that live is worth the bother because every single person I know who's ever looked at the statistics says 95 plus percent of their views are on demand and not live. And so you're sitting here and making a bunch of compromises in your production quality um, in order to serve a tiny minority of your audience. Um, so we had that conversation on the panel and I, I came to the revelation in real time that that's entirely wrong. Because more than 5% of the people are gonna watch or because no. those 5% are so important? No. Because, because a show that has a community is entirely different than a show that has an audience. And Would live. you say that the that the Oprah Book Club is a community? Would you say that Game of Thrones is a community? I mean, there are lots of communities what, what I'm saying that don't is, need to be synchronous second by second. What I'm saying is if we make Twitch work and people start talking to us and saying, well, Saul, what about this and what about this? And we have this interactive relationship with our audience. It's a very different show than you and I talking for half an hour and showing some video. It's, well, you know, there's also the question about, you know, does a small percentage of people make a big difference, right? So with the Huffington Post, less than 1% of the people ever commented, but the scale was so big. Uh, their front page stories, we get 15,000 comments, and that created 
uh, an environment and a sense of community, even though most people, the vast, vast majority, weren't part of it. But you have to understand. It. Anyway, so if you're out there and you are watching us live based on the half an hour notice that you got, um, tweet. I'm watching you at Hacking TV. There, and there we'll... is, in fact, a, a a Twitch live chat thing that I wasn't able to get sorted out in time. Okay. But well, we'll, but, you we'll, know, we'll... go tweet on at Hacking TV and we'll see if, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll ring you up live or read what you have to say. All right. So. Uh, so, Besides VR and the keynotes, anything else in this vast array of hype and showmanship that, that lingers with you? A lot of drones, a lot of autonomous driving cars. Um, but, you know, I mean... No televisions, no Walkmans. No. Nope. Pretty much no cell phones. No. Nope. You know, nope. So it, there's, there are, you know, it's... Uh, the consumer electronics are, are almost not in the consumer electronics show. Well, they, well, it's interesting. They no longer call it the consumer electronics show. They now call it CES. And the organizing group changed its name to the consumer, t to, to the, uh, to, to change the middle initial of their name to technology. Okay. Because they really do want to broaden it. And uh, I think did a very good job. It was a great, it was a great show. I'm, it's a slick. I mean, the, 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 the outfit is a, is a, is a slick outfit. I, I, find the whole Las Vegas thing to be so depressing. Um, I've been there a couple times and don't really ever want to return. I, you know. I, I, I feel fired up and ready to have an awesome year and it was very inspirational and fun. So I, I usually I'm down on Vegas this year. I came back very fired up. So, but, but three big keynotes uh, of which they matter deeply to our audience and us. And, you know, let's Let's dive into those because I made some video. You you asked me to bring back evidence of these things, and I did in fact bring back digital evidence. All right. So the first one, Netflix. Um, what did you hear from Reed Hastings um, that jumped out at you that wasn't that was different than what he had said up to this point? Um, I guess I hadn't really calculated how extraordinarily fast they've grown. I mean, he was talking about the fact that they don't have um, House of Cards in all of their markets as they expand because three years ago they sold off the broadcast rights to for the first window broadcast rights because three years ago was the really the first time they did originals. And if you think about what an extraordinary journey three years has been, I mean, they, they so they announced Netflix everywhere and then, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, they don't have China yet. But they, you know... They added an enormous number of uh, Netflix everywhere in English, or Netflix everywhere in all the languages that, of everywhere. And so, you know. so he was pretty straightforward about that. I mean, he he said, you know, Netflix everywhere in some cases in English, and in some cases in um, in 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 native languages, and they're expanding native languages and exp expanding, you know, translation. But um, it was, um, I mean. It was the, the audience was very fired up to see him on stage. Mm hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I read that his statistics and these are just astounding uh, in the fourth quarter. What people watched 12 billion hours of Netflix. That's up 50 percent from eight billion a year ago. Yeah. yeah. yeah you I know, mean, that's a um, that's a lot. Yeah. So do you want to watch this clip and then we can talk yeah, a little about it? absolutely. All right, Reed Hastings, here we Digital go. Digital content available around the world, including licensed feature films and series. We've also added Korean and Arabic and Chinese to bring our supported languages to 21. From today onwards, we listen, we learn, we improve, we add more languages, more content, more ways for people to engage with Netflix. Okay. Uh, so it's it's astounding. You know, did you get any reaction? I mean, I mean, to some degree, I keep thinking about surprises. And Netflix right now is on an up, up, up trajectory. Except everybody is trying to fill in behind it and get a piece of what they're up to. So I came away thinking that they were further ahead of the game than I realized. 
you know, um, I, you know, uh, Ted Sarandos was on stage as well. I mean, they clearly have great relationships with talent. They're, you know, they're firing on all cylinders. It's extraordinary. And very interesting. And so as we move into what Comcast had to say, right, Comcast, NBC, Universal, presumably are the people who are hurt the most as people shift their attention and their money out um, away from traditional television into new television, you know, was Steve Dirt Burke defensive? What was, you know, how did he play so, all this? So, you know, if you put Reed Hastings and Steve Burke side by side, they couldn't be more different. I mean, Reed Hastings was big, boisterous, take over the world, Netflix for everyone. And Steve Burke was pretty low key. Um, you know, he, he, he was interviewed by Michael Casson uh, from Media Link, and he, um, you know, he essentially said um, the Internet is disrupting all of our businesses, not just television. And television will continue to be the place where people will launch big things. But um, he was, uh, uh, you know, you know, he told a story about trying to kind of get his arms around different ways to speak to young people. And he said, you know, we're sending out these, you know, uh, BuzzFeed staffers uh, to do the Olympics because we want to try and get our arms around, you know, different ways to tell stories. And, you know, it was, he was, um, he was confident, but I would say um, reticent. And and when you see the clip from him, you'll, you'll feel it. I mean, he, um, you know, um, you know, and, and, and interestingly enough, I mean, I thought of him as kind of representing Comcast, but really he was there representing NBC Universal. And do you have a sense, you know, did he talk at all about all of their, the new initiatives we've been talking about all fall on this show, their watchable and the um, various over the top offerings? I mean, did he give you a sense of where that fits into things? Super early, super okay. early days. I mean, he, you know, he essentially said, you know, we're all being disrupted by the web and we're getting our arms around it. Um, he, the, one of the things he said that I thought was fascinating, and I don't think it's in the clip, so I hope I'm not repeating him, but, you know, he talked about the fact that when they bought uh, Universal, um, NBC Universal, uh, they had five big metrics that they counted on and that essentially they were all wrong that theme parks have grown way faster than they thought they would and television's been way flatter than they thought it would be and essentially that while everything net net is up that five because they, they only bought it five years ago and that they made some assumptions in that acquisition that have been upside down and i thought that was fascinating and honest it's interesting so sh shall we listen to what steve had to say yeah, here we go there, there's always been something that was going to put everybody out of business you know satellite was going to put cable out of business well that was 25 years ago when Comcast has never had a down quarter, not one down quarter. Um, and, and, and there's always a new technology, the, the DVD or home video is going to put the movie business out of business. My perspective is that there is more competition now than ever, which makes it harder to break through and have a show that's a hit. But people watch more television today than they ever have, or as much as they ever have, five hours and 45 minutes, whatever the number is. The vast majority of that, that professionally produced television is watched on broadcast and cable. And if you're a marketer, and by the way, we're a big marketer. We spend a billion dollars a year marketing films and theme parks and television shows. It's unthinkable, I think, when you're marketing a big product to a nation of people that you don't use television. So the, the notion that digital is coming in and is going to supplant or destroy the television business, I don't buy. We, 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 we think that digital will take from a lot of different places, but the television uh, advertising will grow. It may not grow dramatically, but will we'll stay the same or grow for many, many years. And then we just gotta be as good as we possibly can be. I think the biggest challenge for anybody running a business in or outside of media today is the increasing impact of the internet on our businesses. And we were sitting in a meeting talking about digital and somebody said, man, it's, digital is really affecting television and, and movies and, and our businesses in a dramatic way. And someone else said, name a company in America 
is not being upended or, or not, not being dramatically changed by the internet. And if, if you're running Walmart or you're running General Motors or you're running, uh, every company is affected by the tremendous change that's going on and ours is no different. I think that we, we have to be as smart as we can be. We have to be unafraid to hire different people and meet different companies and invest in different places. We undoubtedly are gonna make some good bets and bad bets, um, but in some ways it's like the original broadcast companies that, that did or didn't invest in cable. And we're, we're at that stage now. Again, the existing businesses are not gonna go away. They're still gonna be great businesses and people are gonna be watching broadcast and cable te television for many years to come. But we need to start getting better at distributing our product on the internet, getting better at creating new internet businesses and get smarter. So, so that, I mean, that was the thesis essentially was that TV's not going away. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, I but, believe that TV's not going away, but I also believe uh, that everything is going to, you know, that things are going to move very rapidly on demand. And, you know, we've said this before about Comcast. Comcast is so big that they've got some of the smartest people and some of the dumbest people simultaneously doing forward looking and backward looking things. But, 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 but I, what I was surprised by, and again, putting him in Hastings right. and then YouTube in a minute up against each other was how I, you know, when you go to do a keynote at CES, I expected a tech talk about we're doing this and we're doing this and we've got these big ideas and we're innovating here and we're innovating here. And it was, it was not that. It's interesting, and they certainly have things they could talk about if they wanted to. Um, I mean, watch, Watchable did not come up. They are, um, you know, big companies have their own rhythms to them. And as we've said a bunch, I mean, one of Reed's huge focus, you know, attributes is he just wants to do entertainment television everywhere. He's not doing news or sports or all kinds of other things that he could be doing. Um, and so he's got one thing to talk about, more entertainment to more places. And Steve Burke has a billion different things that that company does. Yep. No, it's true. And, and, and it's worth remembering that he's not on the Comcast side. He is on the NBC Universal side. And even though he and Rob and, and, and Roberts are clearly partners and aligned, like he's been tasked with running and evolving the broadcast business and and the theme park business and you know and the movie business that like that's what that's what he's thinking about he was not speaking so, the Comcast. I, mean, I saw a little bit where he's talking about the economics changing right that you know and, and you had some of that in the excerpt right you have just more competition so he was talking about it's getting harder to make your your budgets if you aren't going to be able to sell the reruns because there's so much other stuff out there for people to watch why do you need to watch reruns and so did you get any sense that the studio economics is changing because they they don't have as much back-end revenue as um if so he didn't say that because on the other hand you've also got more buyers right and you've got more windows and you've got you know um I, it's becoming more complicated but i didn't get the sense that you know, I didn't feel like budgets were being driven down. If that, if that, if if you got that from, I mean, to be honest, when you're in a keynote like that, you're all, like, you know, I'm always doing four things. I'm taking pictures. I'm recording video. I'm listening. I'm trying to, you know. So sometimes I learn more when I come home and then read the coverage than when I'm of in course. the room. Uh, but but YouTube was for me the big surprise. Why? Um, so I've seen Robert Kinsel a couple of times, and he's always been. Um, I always thought, like, it never struck me, you know, his title even, I mean, if you, chief business officer, like, doesn't seem like a creative friendly title, but that really his job is, is, you know, doing big deal partnerships and getting creatives onto the platform. And he was as fired up as I've ever seen him. YouTube has changed its story. Even Kinkle has, has changed his story over the couple of years he's been there. What was his big emphasis? What was he trying to position YouTube as this year? Um, it was all about partnerships. It was all okay. about getting people on stage who said, essentially, you know, we built our business on YouTube. I mean, um, 
the CEO of GoPro was so effusively positive about what they'd done together with YouTube and what they were going to do in VR. I mean, it was, you know, it was a lo- it was a, a massive love affair. And so the that's going back to their roots, user generated action cam stuff. If you're going to look at the mix, you know, what w- was it really all, you know, trying, you know, totally user gen and the sort of Michelle fan, you know, user girl makes good or are there, you know, were they doing scripted and professional at all in their narrative? There, there was no mention of any scripted or professional. It was, he he was basically saying, it, I mean, I'll we'll play the clip and you'll see, I mean, he's eventually saying all of the trends are going in their direction. Mobile, music, live, SVOD, you know, you know, he basically said everyone's following them. And and, and, it, and is there, uh, and did he acknowledge that eight or maybe ten people have bought YouTube Red? No. No. Nope. Did he talk about it at all? Nope. Nope. All right. Shall we, shall we listen? Let's listen. To okay, here we go. Digital video is inherently mobile. Since this is CES, it makes sense to start talking about hardware. You may have noticed something on your phones. Every year, the screens are getting bigger brighter, and even sharper. Today's best phones can both display as well as record in 4K. And at the same time, our batteries are getting uh, lasting longer, data speeds are getting faster, and even the sound is getting better. How many child groups? How many, you know, how many of you had to argue and compromise with your parents and siblings when deciding <laughs> what to watch in the living room? How many of you had to do that a couple of weeks ago during the holidays? Your kids, they don't have to do that. They simply go on to their room and watch whatever shows and whatever stars they love. Um, I, I thought it was a pretty impressive presentation, I have to say. So if you were going to say, of those three guys, whose business grows fastest over the next year, you know, who, who is the most successful against what they said they were out to do over the next year? Um, I think it's unclear to me what the worldwide demand for Netflix is, but my instinct is it might be enormous. And if so, they could grow astronomically, filling pent-up demand across the world. I think we have a fair bit of evidence that Hollywood product is appealing around the world. And so I, I certainly, you know, have, see that story and, it, and I understand it, right? So the success or failure of Netflix, assume they don't screw up, is that. How many more people can they reach with the thing they know how to do? And then eventually can they raise prices? I don't know what makes uh, you know, I think Steve Burke essentially is right. They succeed by not hiding from the inevitable changes, but trying to slow them down as much as possible because they'll never have a, a world in which they're as important in the future as they are now. But 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 he's said before and, and said again, uh, you know, while they put big money into both BuzzFeed and Vox, you know, how they're going to get digital into the DNA of NBC Universal, you know, which is a mature company with lots of employees. Like, it struck me that that was, you know, um, uh, that was that, that was very high on his list of concerns. Oh, I'm not so sure in a funny way. I mean, the, one of the reasons I think Netflix is so smart is because it didn't require everybody to do something completely different in the whole supply chain. So if, you know, Adam Sandler sells a movie to, uh, was it Netflix? It was Netflix, right? right. Um, or he sells it to theaters or HBO. It's the same thing. You make a movie, you get a budget, you deliver it, and someone distributes it. And so the universal side can keep selling to Netflix the way they sold to every other distribution outlet. But, but you know, one of the things that Netflix... That Netflix um, was very high on 
was the their the the success of making a mur- of a murderer. Okay. And he didn't talk about it in the keynote, but it was talked about afterwards at the press conference uh-huh. and a bunch of a bunch of their executives and I talked about it. Like and and part of what they're saying is, you know, they're giving unusual edge case content a chance to find an audience and build fans and build buzz and grow over time in a way that the kind of you know the old model which is you put it on at eight o'clock on thursday and you beg everybody to come to see it at a certain time and if it like like making of a murder if you look at it over the last it's been out like i think three weeks and you watch the drum beats as it goes from being an unknown kind of long-form documentary to oh my god this is kind of interesting to wait more people are talking about it to now it's a political thing to i mean it's it's had a series of hops as it gets bigger and bigger and and they're in, you know, they don't need kind of instant hits in the way that the old television business did. You know, as people think about that, they should also then think about whether they really want to wish for a la carte pricing. Because um, when Reed Hastings talks about this, he says, the reason we can do this is we don't have to spend money to market each show separately we can deliver it in a bundle in a very efficient way and it can find its market and we can have different people. And if if everything was pay to watch each separate show, lots of the stuff that you like on Netflix wouldn't get made. And as cable moves from a bundle to all, everything a la carte, we may actually find, you know, things less attractive and less, you know, um, you know, less weird things produce, not more. Listen, I, I think of the three that I saw, and I saw a lot, I mean, I saw the Intel keynote and walked the floor and looked at lots of devices and, you know, spent a lot of time with the Sony guys. I mean, I mean, what's interesting about this show and our audience is, like, nothing that came out of CES this year would you define as bad news for our, for our, for our audience. It was was there any other um, video watching device other than VR that caught your attention? Does Sony, you know, which should be a bigger player than it is, or Samsung or anybody else, have anything that's going to change how people watch TV or how people make TV? You know, Oculus released co- coincident to CES and got a huge amount of buzz and sold out in like 12 seconds. I know people that slammed their credit card against their computer and didn't get one. Uh, at five hundred and ninety nine dollars, um, uh, you know, there were lots of booths showing different. I mean, different kinds of immersive content, and I think that is going to be very important. I think live streaming VR is going to be fascinating, and that's something that the GoPro guys are going to do with YouTube. Um, I I think that you're going to see this business look very different twelve months from now. Okay. Um, these are very cool toys to play with. We should figure out um, how we can do virtual hacking TV <laughs> and pan around Steve's apartment in my under construction ready house in Montclair, New Jersey, and um, you know, sit down and, uh, and and chat with us. I think the fact that we're doing live and that we're letting people begin to engage the show. I'll, I'll consider that a win for a big chunk of months as we figure yeah, that we out. Are, we are winning, but hey, if you right now are listening, especially to the live stream, go tweet. I'm watching at Hacking TV so we can count up how many of you there are. There will be four, and that's fine. Anyway, listen, we are out of time. So, Saul, once again, a fabulous show. Nice to see you. And uh, hack away. And, and we will be back here, same time, same channel, next Sunday night. Um, or something like that. So watch the Twitter stream. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye.